Welcome to the Galileo Ventures podcast. I'm James Alexander, joined by my co-host Hugh Stevens. This is your go-to pod, dishing out the latest unfiltered news and views on early stage tech, served up by two seed stage VCs who don't have time to sugarcoat things. We may not be chefs, but at least we're not afraid to burn some bridges. Actually, scratch that, we love bridges, especially ones leading to successful startups. Whether you're a founder or investor, we've got the operator insights that might make you just say, aha, or at least, ha, interesting. On today's menu, we cover support chatbots versus Air Canada customers, NVIDIA's astonishing growth and CEO's recent remarks, investor alignment gone wrong, and will roast a deck. Hugh, what did you think of that intro? I mean, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm speechless, speechless. So amazing. <laughs> uh, I'm just speechless. And once again, it leaves me wondering, is this computer generated? Because surely it is. Yes, it is. But which one did I use? Which model did I use to right. generate that? Maybe we need to like intro? record a different intro with each different available LLM and then have that, some sort that, of, you that, know, straw poll my, to guess. Correct. That is my that is my goal. So which one do you think I used? Surely it was probably, not GPT-4. Yeah, I imagine. I, I feel like surely Gemini based on what's been on, in the uh, news recently. Yeah. Yes, Gemini. I'm now a subscriber. I'm using the Gemini's lettuce model. Um, you are, if anything, predictable. The <laughs> That could be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on who you ask. Um, I did use the Gemini model. Uh, I am a subscriber. I've been playing around with it. Um, and it was interesting. The first thing it generated for me was this awful script where we were saying things in unison. And we had like music. In, it was bizarre. It was like a very professional script. And it was terrible. And then I basically just got it to cut down and be like, change the joke. And then This is kind of your version of the Willy Wonka AI generated script thing, right? Yes. In some ways, but explain that if, in case someone listening doesn't know what the Willy Wonka script thing is. Uh, well, the, I mean, there's the famous. It's it, where is it's Ireland. Where was it? Where I can't remember where it was. Don't know, I, can't I think remember. it was Ireland. Um, where it could be in Wales, um, where uh, some enterprising person uh, had AI generated everything to create a Willy Wonka experience, sold the tickets with AI generated artwork and everything else, and let's just say gloriously underdelivered. Uh, and you know, there were there were many jokes on Twitter about whether one of the Oompa Loompas looked like they were running a meth lab. Um, there was some very awkward acting that you know you would think people, yeah, just terrible. Interesting. We might link that in the show notes for anyone interested in that. <laughs> kind of had to be there on the internet yesterday. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, had to be there. Um, before we jump into the news, though, I wanted to talk about something a bit more local. Uh, and I thought it was a really interesting story. In the 1970s, an 18-year-old Iranian landed in Hobart, Tasmania. He couldn't speak a word of English. He, has very, he had very poor high school education due to the revolution that was happening. And he only started university something like six weeks later after he arrived. He started at East Tasmania. It turns out while he was at university studying engineering, he was a really strong, avid soccer player. And it was through that that he met another person called Nick Martin, who is a believer lecturer or professor at the University of Tasmania, who had started a little firm uh, to design printed circuit boards using software. I mean, this is the 1980s, right? So we're not exactly... Okay, right. So we're, we're, we're going back through the archives here. Yep. Yeah, correct, correct. Now, the reason I want to tell the backstory is this uh, Iranian uh, refugee joined the firm which ultimately became Altium, which he then became CEO of to run. His name is Aram Merkazimi, who then, as I said, was the CEO uh, of Altium. Fast forward today, though, Renesis, a Japanese company, recently announced it was acquiring Altium for $9.1 billion in cash. Of course, this CEO's shares are now worth something like $652 million, which you know is a fantastic payday. Um, this is now the largest second, second tech acquisition in Australia's history after Afterpay, which was $39 billion, Afterpay Block. Um, however, it is a considerably older company. It listed in 1999. And as I said, it, the journey started in the 1980s. So this is like a long journey, right? Quite a few decades. But nonetheless, a very interesting outcome. I love the story, right? Because it's just this um, classic, like rags to riches kind of story, refugee coming in. Um, um, and building up one of these biggest companies. Um, but 
I think it's a really interesting signal because there are 15 unlisted private tech unicorns in Australia, including Canva, Safety Culture, Immutable, Airwallex, and many more. My question to you, though, is, Hugh, do we think this is a blip on the M&A landscape of Australia, or is this really a sign of things to come, and this is perhaps the smallest acquisition we'll see in the next 10 years? Tricky. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I think I think Ultium has always been a bit of a rare, rare uh, example. It Obviously, has. as you say, listed early, um, quite successfully managed the transition from, I guess, let's call it Web One to Web Two. Yes. Um, you know, comparatively to others, um, very pointy end enterprise. Obviously, you know, very um, narrow use case type enterprise software. Let's call it, um, and you know, sort of became the de facto, uh, you know, platform of use within a very, very narrow space. Um, so, so in that sense, I think very different to a lot of perhaps the, you know, unicorns you just listed and talked about, um, you know, very different to, you know, like an Airwallex, for example. Yes, that's um, right. And a very different kind of space in terms of, you know, what, a, what an M&A approach might look like. Um, yes, it is. Yeah. It's obviously a very I mean, substantial acquisition, but it's also, you know, I think compared to uh, a lot of the sort of B2B SaaS that we see in Australia, you know, very sticky product, obviously, you know, given it's yeah. been around for nearly 40 years, yeah. um, you know, very different kind of product dynamics. Um, plus, I think in terms of the way that we'll see liquidity being generated for those uh, fairly late stage um, sort of, I guess, current unicorns, your 15 unicorns, you say, um, mm. I suspect they'll more go down the path of listing than they will necessarily through an M&A approach. Um, I mean, I don't really necessarily have a lot of data to back that up. Um, but I think, uh, you, know, they'll, and they'll, you know, it will be obviously most rational to run a dual track process anyway for them. Um, in other words, both looking at an M&A option as well as a, a listing option. Yep. But I yep. think I, I suspect that what we'll see is that they'll, you know, they'll list or they'll take that type of approach to be able to, um, you know, see what growth looks like and things like that in the public markets and hopefully themselves become the acquirers of many smaller Australian companies. Um, that Then that's where I guess we'll see that, uh, that change. Yeah, maybe. We haven't really seen a lot of M&A among the unicorns in Australia that I know of. No, it has. I mean, there was even Octopus Deploy actually, um, you know, again, probably one of the more, uh, one of the less frequently acknowledged um, unicorns or certainly very large software companies in Australia, cause it's still very privately held. Um, Octopus Deploy recently closed uh, quite a large uh, M&A acquisition of another um, another partner in their ecosystem or another company in their ecosystem, DevOps uh, Tooling. So, you know, but I think, you know, one of the things that I've certainly always said is that I think one of the disappointments of a lot of Australia's unicorns, and I think if you look at um, safety culture uh, and, you know, safety culture, Airwallex, Canva, like, you know, Canva probably has the most M&A activity, but compared to their sort of, I guess, US counterparts, US equivalents, um, yeah. they have almost none, yeah. um, particularly at that, at that smaller size. You know, there just isn't a culture to the same degree. And maybe it's because we don't necessarily have as much uh, talent on shore for doing that kind of um, biz dev kind of role. Um, you know, maybe that's maybe that's the reason. I don't know. I don't um, know. I'm not sure. I, 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 th I think it's down to the operating teams. Like, I'm not sure we have the M&A teams in, in Australia that you'd have in, in the US is my is my best guess. Um, yeah, you know, so, and, I mean, I wonder if it is just a talent thing or whether it's just a cultural thing of the type of founders that we see in Australia, the type of founders who themselves haven't, you know, sort of experienced that, um, you know, because I guess one of the reasons I think it's common in the US is often the founders are people who have themselves previously run a software company that's had that type of exit, um, yeah. you know, and that they, they were, you know, it was a software company that, that sort of plateaued or whatever, and then yeah. uh, sold on to uh, another party. Um, and then after that is, you know, when they've gone to go and start their next thing. So I wonder if maybe it's that difference in kind of cultural approach because of the difference. You know, it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy kind of scenario. Um, Possibly. But it is, I think, a disappointment. I think I think it means that there's a lot of challenge uh, for those companies that reach that point of, you know, what do you do? Do you just kind of then continue on and be a... Um, well, know, the kind interesting of... thing is, is Canva is roughly $39 billion valuation right now, right? Um, and then the next one down is... Yeah, well, except eight billion. So Canva's definitely of all the unicorn cohorts the exception. So we're talking quite a bit larger. Once you're at Canva stage, I don't think anyone can buy you. Yeah. Like how many companies can buy? I mean, it's it's going to be impossible. Company. I mean, pretty pretty unlikely. Yeah. yeah. So so I think you've got to really just list. So their their option is listing, and we all know there's a lot of 
crazy rumors here and there um and the and you know the i think CFO the last one was, was that was that there's there's movement of an ipo in the next 12 to 18 but i think there's that's been the way for probably the better part of the last four uh, years so yeah but the, my, my my sources inside tell me that that apparently is all over trumped and not like yeah well, i mean the, the the argument against that is obviously they, they did a secondary sale um Correct. to employees and everything else and existing investors not that long ago that's and so right. in terms of the outcome of trying to generate liquidity for the existing shareholders, well, you know, they've just kind of done that. Exactly. Um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I we'll, mean, I think, we'll, I think we'll the see. more likely outcome is we see a Wallex being, being gobbled up. You know, Australia does have so. a very concentrated banking sector. Yeah. You know, what would it look like for one of the big four to buy one of those, uh, buy a company like Air Wallex? That, that would be a very natural, um, you know, I guess, uh, movement. Yeah. Yeah. Are the very banks possible. very large acquirers, very active acquirers in Australia? I mean, not not. Re- I guess not really, not in that sense. You know, it would certainly take a um, a very ambitious thing, and I and I think there'd be a good question of would it be you know would you buy a Wellox or would you buy Judo or you know would you buy someone else that I guess you come at a cheaper cheaper price. Um, you know, Wellox obviously has a lot of the leading brand and customers, um, but if you're a big four bank, you probably already have you know. Yeah, the exactly. Cus- the customer piece isn't really a lot of value add to you. No. Um, also, Airwallex is international, so like whether they want to have that exposure is a whole other thing. Yeah, I mean, they, they do kind of. I, I think that prob- probably the, the bigger question there is whether or not they, they'd be able to stomach the regulatory risk there. Mm. Um, mm. You know, we, we saw a lot of the big four, you know, ANZ closed a lot of its overse- overseas um, international banking arms, um, you know, through the Pacific Islands and things like that. I think pulled out of New Zealand. I think anyway, so. Someone, expanded someone pulled out of New Asia. Zealand recently. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, They've recently pulled back on their expansion plans, um, presumably yeah. because, you know, it wasn't as profitable as they were hoping. Um, so maybe that, that, that sort of runs counter to that, that piece. But I also wonder how much of our Wallox's growth is well, in, in terms of like customer growth, um, is of international customers versus still gobbling up the domestic market. Don't know, don't know. Yeah, but I can no tell idea. you when I was in the U S last year, they were making pretty a big push and there was mm-hmm. a, they were, they were very much well known, like quite a lot of the FinTech people I spoke to know of their okay. growth. So, hey, you know, if we if we if we um, get to that point, we'd love to have the founder of Airwalks on the call, just like we should get the founders. Maybe we should get the founders of all Australian unicorns on here at some. Why point. not? You know, we'll get the roster. you're the one that books all the guests, James. You book me, so therefore you book all the guests. <laughs> yeah, and you're annoying to book. <laughs> um, thank you. I think that's a good answer, Hugh. I think I think it'll be interesting to see what happens. Uh, I don't. I'm not confident that a lot of the unicorns in Australia will list. In Australia, uh, like all time. Oh, yeah, I, don't, I definitely don't think a lot of them will listen in Australia. I think that, that I definitely I agree think, with. I think that will be an interesting ball. Though the Altium exit is a boom for Australian investors, though. So I think that's a fantastic sure. result. Um, although it has been a very volatile stock. So it's not like the, the stock has been a. I mean, I imagine, I imagine fun that's why it was bought. So. Yeah. So interesting time will tell. Let's move on to news. My first news item I wanted to discuss was NVIDIA. Mm-hmm. And for those living under a rock, Yes, very interesting. It is now the fourth largest company in the world by market cap, larger than Tesla, Meta, Alphabet, and Amazon, which is crazy. (laughs) The company grew quarterly revenue at 265% year on year to a measly $22 billion, Hugh. (laughs) The the data segment grew an astonishing 409%. That means yearly sales has hit uh, just over sixty billion. At this maturity of a company, size and maturity, this you could argue the size and speed of this growth has really never been seen before. Like it is growing as if it's a startup in the tens of fifty millions yeah. of revenue, but at this level, it's huge. And of course, why is it growing? What's the reason here? Oh, AI. You wanted me to answer that question. Yes, yeah, so I did. That was a rhetorical question. Okay. <laughs> AI, right? Our favorite topic. Um, on the podcast, we should really just name this the AI we podcast. We don't need another AI podcast. It's bad <laughs> enough. We don't need another startup podcast. So, you know, we don't need another AI podcast. The reason I bring it up is not because I've got to dissect the earnings calls. There's other people that will do a much better job than me on that. I think the reason I bring it up because I wanted to play a segment from Jensen Huan, who is an emerging founder. So we invest in emerging founders and he was a first time founder. He started a company called NVIDIA after working in another tech company. And of course, this was in the early 90s. It's been a long journey for him. Orders of magnitude difference in sort of size, but you know they're not printing circuit boards like Altium. They're doing. They, they just happen to create GPUs that AI that underpins the AI revolution. Um, I'm going to play this short clip 
And then I'm just going to ask you your thoughts because I think it's interesting. And I think everyone on the podcast will really find it interesting. I want to say something and it's, it's going to sound completely opposite of what people feel over the course of the last 10 years, 15 years, um, almost everybody who sits on the stage like this would tell you it is vital that your children learn computer science. Um, everybody should learn how to program. And in fact, it's almost exactly the opposite. It is our job to create computing technology such that nobody has to program and that the programming language is human. Everybody in the world is now a programmer. This is the miracle of artificial intelligence. The countries, the people that understand how to solve a domain problem in digital biology or in education of young people or in manufacturing or in farming, those people who understand domain expertise now can utilize technology that is readily available to you. You now have a computer that will do what you tell it to do. It is vital that we upskill everyone and the upskilling process, I, I believe, will be delightful, surprising. So that is the clip. I mean, it's a pretty powerful yeah, I mean, clip, I, don't you think? I, I, think? I think the whole you know theme of like everyone's a programmer and domain expertise coming to the fore are definitely trends we're seeing in our portfolio, especially with things like relevance AI. But what do you think? What do you make of that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there was a good, and I, and, I, and I don't, I wouldn't be able to pull it up now, but I think there was a good discussion that was ha that happened on on Twitter, the, the platform now known as X. Um, <laughs> but there was a good discussion that I think that that happened about how like every sort of I guess major cycle we have this same conversation when it comes to computer science. You know, when we went from assembly to C True. and then C to True. Java and then Java to, you know, Ruby on Rails and now, you know, Ruby, and then Ruby into JavaScript, you know, full stack and everything else. It's sort of like, oh, look, you know, now more people can program. Now it's easier. And, and it's, and indeed, it, it has consistently gotten easier and easier to be able to do it. You know, if you ask a COBOL programmer, you know, how much easier it is uh, to learn, you know, to get something done in, you know, one of the more modern languages, let's call them. Um, they would say, well, you know, which it's, of course, it's much easier. Which, of course, you know how to use Cobalt, I presume. I, well, but, it, but, I think, but I think at the same time, like if you ask a Cobalt developer, like, would you want to build a core banking system in, you know, JavaScript, they would go, holy shit, you would be insane. And you would be insane to build a core banking sure. system in JavaScript, you know, whether, whether you would use Cobalt again, you know, again, I'm not a, a core systems developer. Um, I think, there's, I think there's, two, there's two sides to this. And I think one side is to say, there's part of it, part of me that goes, yeah, but it's it's pretty conditional. Like I think even with AI yeah, and even with caveats. AI helping us do a lot of stuff, it helps us do a lot of, like I think gone are the days of having to really learn the innards of how to like write a, uh, you know, weird Excel, you know, X lookup, blah, 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 you know, complex rule that goes into an Excel cell that then, you know, does all the things to be able to get the output that you want, right? I think that's pretty much gone. You know, and so sooner or later, I'm sure Microsoft will in, will integrate um, whatever the hell they're calling their AI these days uh, into uh, into Excel, Clippy. and, and I mean Scott you know Clippy. no longer really have to do it, right? And you could just yeah. say to Clippy, "Hey, you know, I want this cell to calculate this number based on this range," and you know, then it just spits out the formula for you, right? So I think think at that sort of macro level, yeah, that there is that piece. But I think when we look at you know, that, and there are software develop software developer jobs that are like that, you know. And I think, but at the same time, like I, the, my counter example here is like Webflow, right? Um, okay. And what do you mean by that? And if you look at Webflow, so Webflow is a kind of like the new WordPress, right? It's it sort of it's a tool that lets you design and build your own website, you know, drag and drop, GUI, um, you know, quite comparatively user friendly. Yep. We use it for our website. To to do anything slightly complicated, right? To do anything slightly complicated, the speed at which anyone can do that, if you have knowledge of the basics of HTML programming and CSS, like, and it's all buttons on the side of the page, right? It's all buttons on the side of the page. It's all that kind of stuff. But to get those layouts that you want, an understanding of like Flexbox, for example, which is a part of CSS, an understanding of Flexbox makes the whole thing so much faster and yep. you generate so many fewer mistakes. And yeah, so I think well, as much yeah. as we talk about how AI yeah. suddenly does that, I think it's a little bit like this piece of where Webflow means you no longer have to write code to be able to choose, you know, the CSS parameters you mm -hmm. want to be able to do. But to actually get the output that you want, you do need some degree of knowledge of what that underlying layer really is to mm -hmm. 
to be able to give the right instruction to get that output that you want. And, and I wonder how much, at least in the short to midterm, you know, long, long term, hard to know, but at least in the short to midterm that, yes, we will see these changes. And, and certainly, you know, my team, my software team, for example, is, um, you know, using AI-based tools, you know, for, for code review and things like that. Um, and they're very handy. You know, they, they pick up pick up bugs and they're, they're great for that kind of thing. But they're still only really good at that sort of individual nuclear function level. I think we're still a long yeah. way to go before I could write in a box, you know, hey, you know, build me a build me Salesforce. Um, well, yeah, I, I, I'm not too sure how far away we are, though, from that. So, yeah. so you know, I think it's I think it's a lot further than perhaps I, I think it's a lot further than the AI maximalists would would like to think. Correct. Yeah, I don't disagree with that. So I would, AI maximalists is a, is a funny way of putting it. I don't disagree with that. I think if you watched my interview with Sam Thorogood, our engineering coach, he actually has a similar line with you, which he wonders that um, are we jumping to conclusions with AI-generated code? Because a quick review of a lot of it so far, some of the results have been it actually creates That's far trash. more errors yeah. and it's much worse than good human And it's certainly uh, not always good at code. writing the sort of code that you would want want to have written that is, you know, composable, dry, you know, all those kind of core engineering principles, AI isn't actually very good at enforcing. Well, that's because it doesn't have common sense as much as people like to say LLMs do have common sense. You know, and it, it also, it's, it's got a lot of, it's got a lot of problems. I mean, we know that the generation still has a lot of problems with observability, which we're going to talk about in a second. Yeah, and... but I think, but I think outside of that, like even, even when I look at uh, for example, this, you know, we're using this AI-based um, code review tool called uh, Code Rabbit, I think is what it's called anyway. Um, cheap, easy, good. Um, a lot of the times it'll recommend things like, oh, yes, you know, you should abstract this part of this function out into a different function so it's composable. And I'm like, no, but it makes no sense to have that function separate to that function. You know, like yeah, it doesn't a thing that. that calculates the GST on a price, it doesn't need to sit outside the way you calculate the price. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, you know, and I, you can sort of, you can see how an AI just purely looking at the code would come to that conclusion. But like the actual logical piece, when you do have that context and that broader understanding, you go, mm, no, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Yeah, um, I think, but I think, I think the, 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 the long arc is there, right? Which is we're going to use yeah. language to create applications. It's going to take, a, it's going to take probably longer than we might think, but it probably, it will happen in an interesting way. But I think, I think the real thing to be is not necessarily that's the trend. It's like, what does that unlock if you have domain experts who can create simple applications, not necessarily yeah, complicated we've applications? Had, we've had no-code tools like Bubble and things like that already for a while. It hasn't, and yeah, I don't think that's don't necessarily think... made that change. Like, I think it's but been, I, I think I think something like I Bubble, it is easy rock. enough. Yeah, but, but, but you could argue that Bubble, um, I don't think Bubble is a good comparison to where we're heading now, though, with natural language code generation. Because yeah. I guess the question would be yeah. uh, these types of applications, which I'm calling sort of single use applications, single use, single, single use software, I think is different. So I think, I think there's going to be, you know, if you're creating a robust CRM for Combank, you're not going to use that. that. You're not going to use natural language, right? But if you're, if it's a simple, if it's a simple task for yourself as a single user, maybe it does make a lot of sense. I'm not sure yet. I'm not sure what these dynamics yeah, are. I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure. I have the same view in terms of where that's going. Mm. I mean, we'll okay. see. We'll see. We'll see. Moving on to the second news item. Um, recently, and this I think is the first precedent. Um, a chatbot for Air Canada uh, gave a misleading result in that it hallucinated a refund policy. Um, this is a quote from Ars Technica. After months of resisting, Air Canada was forced to give a partial refund to a grieving passenger that was misled by the chatbot, inaccurately explaining the airline's bereavement travel policy. Didn't even know airlines have one, but there you go. Of course they do. <laughs> it, might, it makes sense. I've never read it. <laughs> In particular, the chatbot provided inaccurate information, encouraging the customer to book a flight immediately and then request a refund within 90 days. Whereas in reality... That did not exist, right? And I won't go too much into the details of that. What's happened is the airline refused to give a refund and instead offered a coupon code, which then further annoyed the customer. The customer took it to the authorities 
And Air Canada has been forced to actually give a partial refund. Um, in the end, the customers refund the majority of the flight fare, um, which is all great. But I think it's a really good question, a uh, really good example of hallucination having a detrimental impact on customer experience as well as just coming up with a totally fake policy. You know, I mean, I think I, I agree. It's a really interesting example, right? And, and you counter that to, uh, you counter that to, is it, was it gorgeous? Who was it? Someone recently came out saying that their recently deployed chatbot support, you know, reduced their uh, support costs by, you know, 40 million Correct. a year or whatever it was. Was it gorgeous? Uh, Clavio. Uh, Maybe I think it was Clavio, but Klarna just released the Klarna, whole Klarna, yes, Klarna. It was Klarna. Yeah. There you go. I got there yeah. eventually. Um, and, and I think you know that there's a true piece here in that for a lot of inquiries, yeah, you can you can absolutely do that. But the risk here is obviously that you know, as I like to say, I don't like to call them hallucinations, but like a lot of these platforms are confidently wrong. Um, yes. And you know, I, the again, the the prevailing wisdom here was like someone said, like, oh yes, the lesson here is always screenshot everything. Um, you know. But, <laughs> It's but I think, rough. but I think in the same light, like it, it's kind of one of those. It, what was interesting for me was that it wasn't a situation where the airline turned around and said, "Hey, you know what? Like, yeah, like, you know, we're experimenting with new technology, and it got it wrong here, you know, and like we're really sorry that that you know you made this decision based on that information and blah blah." blah. But they actually, even in it was like a small claims court or something in in Canada, they even went out and said, "Oh no 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 no!" Like you know that you know that that's just an assistant. It's not actually. Uh, you know, a representative of the company and, you know, all Correct. this kind of thing. They, kind of... They, they, they said, just to let you know, they said because the chatbot linked to the actual policy that stated the opposite, therefore they were not entitled for a refund, which, which is a complete bullshit. You yeah, can't which say is that. Absolutely. You know, it's the same it's the same as the absolute outroar whenever when Qantas came out and did that thing where they were like, oh, yes, you know, you're not buying a ticket on a, on a plane. <laughs> yeah. You know, you're buying yeah, a right. contract to get you from one place to the other within a a vague time frame, and therefore, as a result, we can cancel flights on every one. Like, yeah. you know, like it, it doesn't meet the smell test, right? Um, yeah. But I thought it was no. interesting that that their initial response was actually to try and dig down on that, like double down on that, and be like, oh no, no, like the, the customer's wrong here. It's like when you go, hey, actually, like this is a really like, you know, if I was running the I'd be like, this is a really interesting example of where this where the limitations of this technology get hit. Like, and it is, you know, and and, and what do you do as a company where you might say if this happens, you know, like I think the reality with a lot of these AI-based customer support things is you will get stuff wrong. And in a situation like this, you treat it like you treat self-checkout at, at Coles or Woolies, right? When you're, doing, when, you, when you're doing the numbers for self-checkout and you go, hey, you know what? People are going to put watermelons, you know, uh, people are going to put, you know, salami through as watermelon um, or, you know, they're going to put, you know, I don't know, some expensive thing through as something cheap. Um, or you know they're gonna they're gonna miss scan stuff, or you know they're gonna quant they're gonna put a quantity of six when there's actually ten or whatever it is. Yeah, a bag like of that, peanuts says apples or something. Yeah, like <laughs> that that sort of that sort of slippage, like that sort of you know breakage, so to say, like that that's priced in because they're obviously saving money on you know the person at the checkout and you know rah, 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 and obviously over time they expect that you know the systems to be able to tell you that you're doing something wrong, you know get better and you know all that kind of stuff, right? But like that was priced in from the start. And I would think that when it comes to this chatbot stuff, some of this stuff is, should just be treated as, hey, you know what? Like this is breakage. Um, yeah. You know, like early on, we're going to see these, uh, we're going to see these mistakes. And the reality is we're just going to have to accept that as long I as agree. we cap the cost to us as, you know, to a couple hundred bucks, well, you know, if it gets an error wrong that's a couple hundred dollars worth and it saved us 30 grand, you know, I agree. we absorbed I a couple agree. hundred dollars. I agree. But I think in this particular case, the bad PR is going to be much worse than just the refund yeah. in this stage, right? And I'd, I'd love to know what the chatbot client is. Do you have any information? I didn't. I couldn't find off the top of my know. head. I presume it'll be something awful in enterprise. Yeah, so it might be. But I wonder if it's like one of the big ones like Intercom. Or like or a Zendesk like. one or something, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, maybe the Zendesk one. Um, I think it's intriguing. Uh, what do you think it means for founders? So we're seeing a lot of founders building LLM chatbots for various things, you know, uh, whether it's education, whether it's teaching assistance, whether it's um, research assistance or investment tools. What do you think it means for startups, knowing that this sort of observability safety aspect of LLMs is really still missing and we don't actually know how to solve that just yet? Yeah, I think I, I think it's a really good question. And, and the other example that comes to mind, um, you know, is, is things like, you know, um, AI-based clinical note-taking for healthcare. Yeah. Yeah, which is a big topic now, very um, hot space. And very, very hot side. space, very, very hot yeah. space. Don't get me wrong, you know, and 
that's obviously the first step towards doing AI-based diagnostics in healthcare, you know, yeah. sort of turning, you know, being Dr. Google via chatbot. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we, we have seen a number of these challenges of like what, you know, what happens when people trust Google as a doctor? Um, you know, and so what happens when people trust a chatbot as a doctor? But then what happens if even in a trusted clinical environment, the, uh, you know, that the AI-based clinical note actually misrepresents the consultation? You know, like that's not a sort of, he said, she said scenario of where, you know, one person says, oh, yes, you know, I said this in the consultation. The patient says, oh, yes, I said this in the consultation. Now it's, oh, the note says that, but actually I don't think it said that. And someone else goes, oh, but that's what your note says. And they go, oh, well, the, you know, the, the AI got it wrong. Sure. Um, you know, and, and I think there's a whole series of sort of, I guess, uh, regulatory, you know, all, all kinds of challenges there that we really have to be able to solve. And like, I think the question for founders is like, in that, in that negative case, that's going to happen, right? It's going to happen. You can guarantee it's going to happen. It's a bit like accidents and self-driving cars, right? It's going to happen. Same thing. Yeah, it's going to happen. Um, but like, is that like, is that sort of breakage acceptable? Yes. And correct. I think that's what yeah. we're really going to have to work out and communicate and start to really kind of um, draw down into is, hey, if you're building, you know, chatbots for critical infrastructure, um, that's going to be really challenging. You know, yeah, I mean, like, in the end, like, human, it's like, it's human like error for, in hospitals is what, how, be, how bad is that? That's a huge yeah. component of death, right? So if it's less and, than that. But, but I mean, in the, same, in the same light, you know, if you look at it in other ways, like AI, AI generally, broadly speaking, has been in use in finance and trading for yes. a long time, right? Very, very long time. But if you ask almost anyone who is in, you know, big scale quantitative trading, they go, holy shit, we test things a lot before we let it go. Yeah. Because when you let it go, it it loses a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, which brings um, up the interesting question of AI safety, uh, which I just call testing. And and and, yeah. and really, I mean, I think I think I think there's a lot of over inflation of AI safety to beyond just like good practices before releasing software that have consumer applications and detrimental impacts to consumers. But I don't know. Um, some people think it's a bit 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 broader. Uh, but we won't talk about AI safety right now because I think uh, that's for another topic. Uh, as we unfurl the regulations in Australia, I would actually like to spend a little bit of time discussing that in another future episode. All right. That's an interesting, it's an interesting uh, example. And I think um, I would love to see, I, I'd love to maybe track some of the more examples of chatbots hallucinating or just AI tools hallucinating generally. So if anyone's got any tips, send them our way. We'd love to hear it. Moving on to the third article. Uh, third item for news, this is a more local story, and it's around the perils of industry investors. Hugh, do you want to introduce this particular news topic? Yeah, so I thought this was an interesting one. So um, uh, I think Startup Daily, we, we're trying to remember which exactly news source we originally saw it in, but uh, Startup Daily did a piece um, off the back of a Twitter thread um, from the founder of Employment Hero, um, which is a large uh, kind of, uh, I guess, like payroll, payroll uh, platform, let's call it, employee onboarding, payroll, all that sort of stuff. Uh, large payroll platform here, uh, talking about how uh, the founder kind of, uh, I guess, had a bit of a rant um, about Host Plus, one of our large superannuation pension funds in Australia. Um, they put a submission into a, um, you know, to a government consultation, um, effectively saying that, you know, some of the core features of Employment Hero that, you know, they themselves see as a big benefit to consumers um, should, shouldn't be allowed, right? And, the, yeah. and that the, the product should be restricted. And of course, the challenge here is that, uh, so Host Plus, you know, via some of the, uh, I think via some of the, the large um, VC funds. I don't know if, it, I yeah. think it's not direct. Um, Host through. Plus is also an investor. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, the founder sort of went, oh, yes, you know, why is, why is this investor, uh, this person who's, you know, I guess incentivized in our success, you know, why are they coming in and saying, you know, hey, these core features are that we see as being, you know, very consumer friendly. Yeah. Um, why are they saying that they should be banned? you know, this is ridiculous, blah, 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 you stifling innovation in the country, everything else. Um, and I think the, the question I guess I really wanted to answer, or I guess the question I guess I wanted to pose out of this is like, you know, I think this is one of the challenges of when you have these, you know, and we, whether it's a corporate VC, so whether it's, you know, let's say the, the Woolworths venture capital um, arm, or whether it's the fact that in Australia, particularly a lot of the large, super, you know, uh, the large uh, funds are ultimately, you know, underwritten by Australia's pension sector. That's the yes. reality. We have a huge pension sector. We have a huge superannuation sector. At, at what point do you worry as a founder about the risk of, you know, you becoming, I guess, like a, a against the core strategy of one of your investors? 
And what do you do? Like when they have information rights and they've got, you know, potentially board seats, um, you know, what do you do if you start, say, hypothetically competing with, um, with one of the one of your core investors, or you know, you start doing something that may actually harm, you know, their, yep. um, you know, market yep. business, whatever way it, whatever you want to talk about. Um, what do you do as a founder? Yep. Yep. I, it's a it's a tricky question. It's a tricky situation. In fact, I think there's a broader question here, which is, should industry superannuation funds, like industry backed, right? necessarily be directly investing in high risk startups because they are right and and as you said they're they they are potentially uh have their own agendas when it comes to certain industry sectors and especially when it comes to policy around uh, you know and this is arguably a very anti-competitive mood by host plus because they want to try to protect well, their they're trying to protect their their flow of retirement savings coming into their yeah, and um, I mean, th- th- I mean, there's a long, there's a long history to that, right? There's a very long yes, history to what very default superannuation is in ex- in Australia, yes. and that, like, there's a lot of, and that's a that's a complex political issue that is, I would say, vastly unrelated to some startup. You know, like, yes, yes it obviously affects the startup, but like, the the political maneuvering of the realities of what it is to be an industry based superannuation fund and what default super means for people's, uh, you know, superannuation choices and everything else, like, that that's a that's a big, complex, long-running political issue that just like, yeah. you know, it's it's not a, it's it's not host plus having a go at you, Mister Startup. You know, it's yeah. it, it's a very very different set of issues. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think going back to your first question though, like, how do you have investor alignment? Which is yeah, what well, you're talking about. I, I mean, I think the other question is, do you need it? You know, like these these companies are big companies, right? The the person yeah. who's the person who's written this uh, you know policy position or you know the, this paper that went into a you know Senate inquiry or whatever it was, consultation, you know, like that's that's not the head of you know VC no. for Host Plus. Like they're not no. the one that's put in the paper. It'll no. be you know some government relations person or even some you know outside government relations person that's been engaged to write the cons- you know the submission to the consultation. Um, you know, and, and like big organizations all the time have problems where, you know, left hand, right hand problems of where one side is doing something that, that totally harms the other. And, and so I think, you know, for one piece, I would say, well, it's inevitable, you know, like, and it's kind of, you know, what happens, there's the risk you take when you, when you have a sophisticated, whether even an angel, right, even an angel that is an industry participant in some way, um, it's a risk that you take when you have them on your cap table. But also, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that as a, you know, let's say as a fintech startup, you want to exclusively have, I don't know, deep tech hardware VCs because the risk that they'll never be able to compete with you, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. I think the normal the normal situation, you know, I was reflecting on what are some other examples here. And I think this is a really interesting, unique example because you've got an industry super fund that has an industry of gender. Um, whereas typically, you know, if you think back, one of the famous ones was probably Uber versus their original seed investor when they wanted to get Travis out of the board because he was too volatile and he, there was too many bad news items and all, you know, there's a lot of scandal. And that's probably a good example of there's a particular individual in the company. But when it's the actual company strategy piece, <laughs> I think um, I haven't found too many good examples and I haven't done enough research having said that, but I'm sure there'll be some strategic, there's some probably some more uh, on the strategic investor side where you see some of this happening where there's some of the strategy drift um, that may happen, and that goes against the parent company that's invested, or what have you. Um, I mean, I think, I think, I think the classic example here surely is like in a, the context of where, uh, in, in the context of where uh, there the the company is a potential acquirer. You know, yeah. And well, what do you do? What do you do when there's a deal on the table, and well, you know, the they Google, want to block so, the deal because it'll go to the competitor correct. of theirs. Yeah. Than so them. from memory, in Uber, and and I might be getting this wrong, but Uber also had Google as an investor at one point, and that caused a huge amount of attention because it was potentially going to be competitive. Et cetera, et cetera, and then there was the driving car scandal, which you know became a huge thing. Um, I think it's a really tricky problem. Um, I always say to investors, so if we take it back to early stage founders, I actually take it back to one of the simple problems I always see in Australia is investors that have a goal for a company when they invest, so an outcome they want to achieve, and the founders having an outcome that they want to achieve, and the two outcomes are vastly different. Yeah, and I think that's. That's the simple advice I'd be have is like know what the investor wants to see in the outcome of this company. Um, 
I think it's much harder when you're talking about the investors, investors, the LPs of the GPs, <laughs> sure. because, and maybe you don't need to know, right? Because in theory, they, they have no to say anyway, right? They're, they're disconnected. And I would also say though, in Australia, we've got a potentially a, a reckoning that will come because um, what's really going to happen in Australia is technology is going to have a huge impact on some of these labor markets. I mean, the one that we've been at the forefront of is construction, right? And some of these industry super fund members are these people in these industries that will be hugely impacted. So I wonder, especially in Australia, where there's a huge concentration of superannuation as a source of money, whether that's going to be a point of contention in the future. Yeah. And I mean, I think it's, you know, the other piece is, um, the, the other piece is to say, you know, as many as for, for every time that founders think, oh, well, it'd be so great having this person on the cap table. Um, because they'll be able to open doors for me is that they could also close doors. Yes. Yes. And we, we, we are, you know, de definitely we're seeing some of the, poli I'll call it the politics of, of investing coming to play um, more and more so as, as these companies have a bigger impact on traditional sectors, um, which is further going to be filled by AI, of course. Interesting problem. Uh, will be one that's watching. I've got to uh, watching very closely. We're going to put the link in the show logs for anyone that hasn't seen or wants to read up about this particular issue of uh, Host Plus versus Employment Hero, which is also one of our unicorns. Um, and always very interested in people's comments and thoughts. Please write in. Very happy to hear. Moving on to Roast My Deck, we are going to look at a pitch deck and roast a deck. How does that sound here? Sounds great. On to our next segment. We are going to review our first pitch deck of the year for this podcast. This one came through recently, but Hugh, before we jump into it, why don't you give a quick overview of Roast My Deck section. Why do we do this? Sure. So, I mean, this section is about us talking through a deck that we've been sent or volunteered, I guess, for us to use live. And the idea of that is that we can give founders a good idea of what goes through the minds of VCs as they read decks. Obviously, people spend a lot of time thinking about what's in their deck and everything else. And so, you know, we sort of want to try and be a, give a fairly blunt and direct view of, you know, what we think as we go through them. Yeah, cool. Thanks, you. Okay, so this deck is a pre-seat company. They're raising their first round. I thought it would be great to start off the year with back to, you know, something that's super early and give everyone, the punters, our listeners, a sense of, of the market. Also, a reminder for those that are listening on the Spotify podcast or wherever you get your podcasts, you can look, open up the app to look at the video or you can jump on YouTube if you prefer uh, on this part of the segment. Otherwise, we will narrate this as best as possible uh, for those just listening. Hugh, what do you think of slide one? Look, I mean, I like the simplicity of the, you know, sort of what it is piece, as we've sort of covered in the past, I like the first slide to cover what your company actually does. Visually, it's sort of got this weird R story thing on the left, which I think is meant to be like a sort of subtitle for what the deck is about, which I don't think is either necessary or confuses me a little bit, but that just, that's a bit nitpicky. But otherwise, good, easy, might be nice to have a bit more visual elements, screenshot, some sort of picture, just kind of got a logo. I agree. But that's about it. I agree. Could do a little bit. I agree with that feedback though. All right, slide two. Okay, let's have a look. So problem slide, it's in 2020, 90% of universities moved online. Again, so everyone knew that. Post-COVID decline in global educational standards. I, I sort of got a bit of, you know, sort of citation needed on that one. Yeah. Students are fed up and disengaged. Educators too busy to give feedback. Look, I don't think this problem slide is as strong as it could be. I, I mean, I'm, we'll see what the company is about. But I think just sort of saying, oh, yes, you know, we moved online post-COVID. ChatGPT exists and students can cheat with it and educators are really busy. I'm like, that's sort of one of those problem statements of like, it's kind of timeless problem statement. It's not really a new one. You yeah. know, like educators not having enough time to give good feedback and students cheating on shit. Like students have cheated for a long time. A very long time. Educators Nothing have never had enough time to give the feedback that they would potentially like to give. Like, yeah, I agree. I agree. Students so hate that process. Like, I, think, I don't know. I, I, don't know if I, I don't know if this really tells me what's changed. Yeah, I think my feedback would be get more specific. We, you know, we haven't jumped to the customers yet, but like as much as possible, specificity is hard. This also fails the uh, logo test, which is if I was to swap their logo with another EdTech startup logo, this would still apply. So, you know, 
this isn't as specific as it needs to be, but nonetheless, sure, broad problem. Okay, I believe it. Slide two. Okay, I don't know if James can stop this, but it's I'll got stop this, the video. Yeah, it's got this auto playing yeah. video. Really irritating. Hate auto playing videos. Video fine. Auto playing video really annoying because you open it up and you're like, Pet Whoa. Peeve. I mean, you know, we sort of talked about needing some stats to back it up last time. I mean, he's, you know, like I look at the thing on the right and it's like it's quoting Forbes and I'm like, well, you know, <laughs> even six, six, <laughs> you're quoting really? not the highest quality sources, right? That's maybe a nicer <laughs> way to put it. And CNBC and I, I don't know, like, I don't know, it's a bit, it's a bit, I can see where as a founder you would take a product like this and, and sort of whip up a series of the sort of TV reports that are very like, oh my God, students are cheating with their, on their exams and it's a disaster. But like, it's yeah. kind of, you know, you're sort of sharing today, tonight segments, yeah. you know, like you're not, it's not really giving you that authority. It's more just like you're, you're sharing ambulance chaser news. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's new alarmist news designed yeah. to be interesting for 30 seconds. And it's probably for an investor pitch, not quite the right tone in my view. Yeah. Well, I think there, there'd be better ways to do it. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I don't think it's terrible. Just to be like on the scale of one to ten, I think I put it somewhere around six. But like, I don't think it's like a two. But I think it, it seems a little bit unnecessary. But also, I would also say if you've got numbers, put the numbers in the problem slide. Make it one slide, right? Like the other thing is the problem slide wasn't really crazy problem statements that I would never believe. Like they're all very believable, timeless problems. So you know, I, I again, I think you could buy these two things together. Let's go to slide three. Again, AI powered digital teaching assistant. It sort of uses emojis to explain what it is. I'm kind of, again, this slide, because it doesn't really have a, doesn't have like screenshots or anything. I, I wonder if it's a pre product business at this point. I go, that's what I thought like, too. We haven't got yeah. any pictures of what, what they've built yet. Anyway, the bullet points that it shows, or I guess little sections that it shows, a little illustration. The illustration, again, nice, but isn't actually a specific product screenshot. Automated conversational assessments. I'm like, yeah, yeah, okay, cool. But how is that really different to just a student passing an assignment, is, you know, pasting an assignment to chat GPT? Aggregated cohort insights. Yeah, possibly interesting. You know, that whole world is busy though. Like, you know, your LMS, your core LMS and, you know, all that sort of system has that. Automated personalized feedback. Again, is this just, you know, giving lecturers a way to be able to, or, you know, tutors a way to be able to check everyone, check a box next to everyone's assignment and hit send chat GPT feedback, which I'm not sure is necessarily pedagogy and flag students need more assistance. You know, again, there's a whole product space in like how you identify students that are challenged early, but I would also say nothing ever really took off commercially in that space. Like it's all been nice little products and research projects that don't seem to have ever really been a big commercial outcome. Uh, I think that, I think there are some early, some successes locally. But success, venture the, scale success? Yeah, but like, no, in small, in, in there's some early success in some really specific categories, like in sports and in mental health. Um, so, and they've gotten some pretty good adoption, but yeah, I think but that's too I don't early know if, to say. Yeah, but business. I don't, but knowing the companies you're talking about there, like, I don't know if they're necessarily taking it from a analytics standpoint. They're generally taking it from an integrated vertical, like a vertically. Yeah, vertical. correct. Yeah, yeah. I, I think tracking they're making students, money replacing the e, you know, like the EAP. Yeah. They're not making money. Correct. Yeah, yeah giving yeah. you analytics. I think track. So, so for ed tech generally, my experience has been tracking student progress and giving personalized assistance is like a holy grail that a lot of ed tech wants to do, but never really gets up there. They're usually replacing some other aspect, or they they end up you know using other methods. But, but nonetheless, I'm going, oh, yeah, these are like, these are solution spaces that people have tried to get into ed tech in a big way, but I don't think anyone's really get over the incumbents that are in there. Yeah. All right. No, but okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay. I'm going to pause on the demo video, which is... Okay. Demo video. Again, auto playing video. I don't, I don't, I mean, personally, I don't like... I don't like actually watching video. That's a personal preference. So generally speaking, I'm like, link me to a video for more, but the slide should speak for itself. I agree on that. I Having definitely agree that, the slide should speak for itself. Irrespective, yeah. auto playing video, bad. Yeah. Anyway, but demo video. Look, the thing says, the subtitle at the top says, the only AI powered digital teaching assistant educators will ever need. And I'm like, mm, it feels a bit like marketing website copy. 
And even then it's not very good marketing website copy. So I'm not so sure <laughs> about that. Like let's, you know, let, let, let's use something else there to talk about what it is that's unique about the product rather than yeah. just kind of a generic platitude. But in the demo video, it's, James is just clicking through the, the segments of it. Yeah, um, so I, I wanted to show this segment, which is halfway through the video, which I was like, why not just show me the screenshot of Cindy, the chatbot app, right? Which is, I think this is the presuming the professor view, because this is welcome back, Professor Stephen Jemison. Like, sure, it's a sort of looking generic looking ja dashboard, but if they could show me this and then like actually break apart what is happening, then I go, great. So you've got a product, you've put some thought behind it, you know, then we can go into the detail. I would much prefer that to this demo video, which feels like, I agree, it feels like a marketing pitch as opposed mm. to a investor pitch. But it's a slick video, so, you know. It's, it's actually a very nice video. And, and again, the only critique I would say is now is the only point at which we're seeing product. sort of product. Yeah. But cool. Points on slick video, but perhaps could be screenshots. All right, let's go to the next slide. Introducing check-ins. Don't think check-ins are particularly new, but I think this is a product. Okay, um, so let me have a look. question. Yeah, this looks like a feature. This yeah, sort of it feels is. like a feature. Like, and I think again, it, it feels a little bit too marketing website oriented when you sort of like introducing check-in and here's the definition of it. Like, you know, I think if this is the core of how the product works, and I would sort of say like, you know, we do this through check-ins. Like, I don't know, but again, it just feels a little bit too marketing website. Integrity check-ins, understanding familiarity. Yeah, like, I don't mind that. Learning check-in. Yeah, that, I mean, that just sounds like assessments. Yeah, it is essentially automated assessments I, I, as my interpretation of this, which, by the way, is kind of like where we, we've seen a lot of ed techs in automated assess, assessment generation and, and automated um, uh, question and answering about the content as a way yeah. to Like test. upload the slides, get a, you know, series of Anki, yeah. you know, yeah. What's the yeah. word I'm looking for? Questions, Q and A, flashcards. Flashcards. That's the one. Yeah. Yeah. We've seen quite a few of them. EdTech founders tend to be very they surprised. They come and go, actually, those. I have, we haven't seen have. as many recently, but early, early sort of GPT-4, we saw a bucket load. Yes, correct. That, and I think EdTech founders are a surprise when I tell them, oh, yeah, we've seen that. That's happened before. But the reality is flashcards just turns out not to be, you know, the most important thing in the educational stack of software. I don't mind this slide. I, I agree with you. It's a bit too markety, but at least I've gone, okay, cool. There's something about the workflow and product flow that is unique to them. Okay, cool. I'm interested to find out more. All right, I'll move on to the next slide. Traction slide. Love attraction slide. Okay, traction slide. Again, I, let's bring this up. Bring this up in the, you know, like if you have real traction and you're, you're a pre-seed company, like let's, you know, let's get going. Okay, so having a look on the left, large scale. Okay, so one, you said you're bootstrapped and you got a large scale trial secured. I assume this is just a founders team. So I, I don't know if I'd really call that much. Um, product trial, okay. I, I don't know go, what that like, means. It, yeah, like if we've said about large scale trial and then product trial, like what does that mean? 20 participants, 85% feedback. You're saying you've just done like a, effectively a UX session? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's what I think. I think you got to be really careful about the words product trial and large scale trial. To me, that means you've like signed papers, you've signed with customers to do something with the product live. And, you know, if that doesn't mean that, then I wouldn't use those words. That's sort of my personal opinion on that. And then the thing that makes me a little curious is when you say MVP done on the right hand side, I'm like, what does that mean? If the MVP is done and you've done a trial, you know, how early is this product now? Because now, because the dashboard yeah. I saw before, I was like, oh, that looked pretty comprehensive. It looked quite polished, yeah. Yeah, so now the other I'm thing like, is, oh, maybe. The, and the other thing I'll say is, I don't really care about things you've won. And if anything, saying you won a Web3 hackathon is absolutely a bit of an anti-pattern for me personally. Again, personal preference. <laughs> but also it makes me go, oh, is this actually secretly about to tell me, oh, we've got all this blockchain involved, blah, blah, blah. Like, are you trying to just say to me, hey, like I met my co-founder through a Web3 hackathon yeah. and we won it and it was yeah. really fun. Look we tried what new technology the... and I'm like, great. Okay. That's actually a really good situation to share. Like yeah. we want a hackathon, a bad situation to share a hackathon is we rammed crypto slash web three into this random piece of SaaS products and one at web three hackathon because it was everything that was even slightly sort of functional. Yeah, exactly. Look, I, I, I have, I think I share your sentiment in this. I think founders should not put on competition, startup competitions on their slides period. Yeah. I think it doesn't help them from an investor lens. 
I think it's great for vouders for marketing. Press like to hear it. I get that. Maybe customers like to hear it too, depending on your sector. But for investors, I always, I'm always just like, oh no, you've jumped to competition to competition. Totally appreciate though that like it's an achievement, and I think it's great, and I think it's awesome, and they're really and get, fun. And, they, and you get 50k. Look, they raised 50k in funding, non dilutive funding. Amazing. I think that's incredible. Yeah. That's really cool. But yeah, I agree with you. I, I think emphasizing it too much always a bit naff for me. Mm. All right, let's do the next slide. So traction slide. Next slide is ongoing traction. More traction. Okay. I think this is pipeline. Okay. So yeah, I guess this is pipeline. So let's let's go oh. pipeline. Yeah. Now, and, okay. So so next point of next comment, you've got logos saying you're already talking with a series of logos here. One, two, three, four are Australian universities. The fifth is not, and then you've got these little like little location things across random places yeah, across the that. globe. I'm like, oh, this map I was, that out. was really confusing to me. I was like, are you talking to all these different countries? I, I, can, I imagine it's like the top is top of funnel pipeline, and the bottom is like engaged pipeline. Don't know, um, but Don't know. not as direct. You know, not as directly obvious to me. On the right side, we've got updates upgraded to paid pilot. I'm like, okay, cool. 20 to 30K in semester one. Holy shit, that's not very much money. I like, I mean, you know, it's always going from no revenue to getting someone to pay something is very important. And often the first price isn't necessarily vitally important. But again, I sort of look at a tool like this and I'm like, if it's 20 20 to 30K per course, maybe? I could kind of see that. Don't, we don't know. But even, we don't know. even 20 or 30K but, per department still feels like it's a bit overly cheap. Maybe, yeah. I mean, this the problem with this is it looks like it's for the entire university, which obviously is not true. Yeah, which know. I imagine is like a, a pilot rollout to, you know, a course, a course or a segment yeah. or something like yeah. that. But like, you know, I think when you say estimated revenue, I'm like, is that just estimated pilot dollars? In which case, okay, cool. But like, if you think that at scale, this is what the price of the tool is, oof. Yeah, I, I agree. You should put some caveats around that. Maybe it's like put the number of spe- Just specify like, you know, pilot pilot course cost 20 to 30K semester one. Yeah. You know, fully scaled out. Agreed. Potentially 300K plus, 500K yeah, plus, agreed. whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. Cool. I like, I also the thing I like is there's an American university in there. I don't think you need a world map with dots on it, but I, I think having an American university is great because, you know, for us building building to sell into the US or Europe, or Asia is, is always something that we like to see. All right, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so B2B Enterprise SaaS, cool. Now, it talks about the model, the, the, the market sizing by talking about the number of students. Okay, so we're going to try and license based on student seat, right? Sure, that makes sense. Then I go to subscription, it says ARPU, $400 per year. So you're trying to get $400 per student per year. That's a lot of money. It is, yeah. That's a, like universities do not pay four hundred dollars per student for like a core LMS, let no. alone good a teaching tool. <laughs> if they did, Canvas would be very happy. Yeah, uh, and make probably four x the amount of money that they make. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> I wonder. So so what that says to me is it goes. I mean, it's a nice counter to the previous slide. And the previous slide said to me, "You're not charging enough." This one says to me, "You probably haven't done enough price discovery yet." Which isn't yeah, necessarily correct. a bad problem but just means that like, I'm not sure it's quite right. Both of these pieces, I guess to me would say as a seed investor, like here are really clear opportunities that of, of things you're going to discover during this sort of like seed to A level that I think are going to polish a lot of these things up. So yeah, I agree. it does say, doesn't necessarily hugely concern me. No. It more just sort of says to me, okay, like you, this doesn't feel like you've sort of gone through that price discovery process yet, or you understand the way that these things are bought and licensed by universities. Yeah. yeah. The other, the other interesting thing is the annual contract. Like, I get that they're trying to say they want to do four, four million per year per, I presume, university. University, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't know. I just, I look at that and go, well, you really have to be a pretty core cool system for the universities. You pay that much money on an annual basis for you. Yeah, I wonder um, if they even pay that for their like student record system. They probably don't. Pro- probably not. Oh, they might if it's they- like Salesforce or something. Yeah, I know how much they pay for Salesforce and, and things like Canvas, like the coil MSs, and it is it's more than that uh, okay. for the big ones. It's actually quite a bit more than that. But but for just non LMS coil LMS systems, it very drops down very quickly. Yeah. So well, or that's a bit I mean, this is the interesting thing. I think it's an interesting business model here in that like and I and again I would challenge the founder on a caller, I'd ask the founder on a call, I should say, not challenge them. 
And I also found on the call, like, have they considered the sort of shadow IT bottoms up thing of selling to, yeah. you know, lecturers or tutors or whatever at a, you know, cheap clip of, I don't know, the 800 bucks a semester or 500 bucks a semester or whatever, with the intent of then being able to ladder their way up into a cross university deal. And I go, hmm, okay, yeah, sure. There's some degree of interesting sort of virality or capacity for the tutors to share. And like that, that's potentially an option, I guess. And we'll obviously speed their time to market much faster than trying to go through university procurement channels. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Okay. Might move on. This is also an interesting thing with combining business model and market size here, which I'm totally fine Actually, with. Actually, I, I quite like it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm not sure about these numbers here, but but at least they've thought about something around a market yeah. size. I get that part. Okay. Let's go to the next slide. Competition. Okay. So first one is turn it in. I'm like, ah, I was at university. I know what turn it in is. So I, I, I like that piece, right? I like that piece. And I think everyone knows the perils of the turn it in. I mean, like I still remember, I think one of my assignments, like it had, it had highlighted as potentially, as potentially plagiarism, the like the footer of one of my graphs because it was a series of years. You know, yes, absolutely. Plagiarizing I think everyone, the time scale. Correct. Everyone can agree <laughs> that there's limitations to those existing tools. I mean, I sort of go, well, like, you know, it, it gives, from what I understand of turn it in, it gives some degree of assurance. Does it give amazing assurance? No, but you're never probably going to offer perfect assurance. Hmm. But like universities clearly trust it, for want a better term, or yes. like see enough value from it, probably a better way to put it, see enough value from for it to pay for it. And so I sort of wonder a little bit. And, and you know, the point of it is much more that historical data, hey, you know, we've got previous assessments and then rolling them forward, you know, and I presumably so, they, yeah. you know, collect all of the other ones or whatever. Like, and so it's got a data collection piece that I'm not sure how Cindy, Syncidium, whatever, uh, is going to solve. Yeah. Whether it's going to sort of solve that integrity issue of, hey, I've taken the person's assignment who did this course three years ago and then lightly edited the text and submitted it. That's kind of the idea of where Turnitin is meant to have, from what I understand at least, is meant to be detecting. And I'm not sure how an AI solution is going to de detect that without that sort of corpus knowledge, the data corpus piece. And then teach flows, I'm like, sure, I, I, it makes sense that there's feedback tools existing in the market for universities, but I don't really know a lot about it. So yeah, yeah. interesting, gives me a couple of logos. I'd actually probably rather this be like a two by two with more logos because yeah. then I can, I, with markets yeah. I don't know as well, I'd rather have more logos so I can kind of Google the names and like get some idea of what their marketing messaging is yeah. and positioning myself yeah. than just having two logos of the most direct competitors or the yeah. most well-known. Yeah, my, my top feedback points for this would be, these aren't the only competition. There's actually quite a few more. There's some, turn it in is really indirect here, unless you want to just be a exam, like an automated assessment feedback slash integrity checking tool, in which case, great, but I would probably change this whole deck entirely if that was the case, if you just want to place turn it in. Turn it in is a pretty big business. But if you kind of include the AI chatbot stuff, which we saw before, then there's really some other direct competitors that have popped up recently. And I think they should be mentioned here. And what else would I say about this? Oh, the other thing I was going to mention is, you know, it's a really tricky space now because if you look at Chegg, which obviously in the US was the big, big, they call it the cheating, exam cheating assistant, but the study assistant, you know, that's a big business, right? Mm. But it's been very severely impacted, at least last time I was looking by ChatGPT because obviously Correct. students can just jump yeah. on that. And so I also kind of go, well, what's happening on that side of the market? Because you've kind of got these like study aid tools, which are now you can just use ChatGPT. Yeah. Um, and then and the challenge that yeah. they really had was they were trying to charge, you know, 300 bucks or whatever Correct. for something you could get from ChatGPT out of the box, often better than the specialist solution. Yeah. Okay. And obviously the hard part is, particularly if you're selling to students as they were, students are cheap. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, should do a follow-up on Chegg, actually. Maybe you'll pin that for another podcast. Interesting. Interesting one to get your views on with your background, James. Yeah. All right, team slide. Okay, team slide. Now, this is a weird, this is a confusing team slide for me. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Bonus points for the edited heads. You know, I, I like photo. the edited. I like the edited I heads. Like the team I like it too. I like it too. I do, I like, I do it. like that part. I do like a team photo. It shows, shows team size. A lot of people. Suddenly we've got 20 people. I'm like, oh, okay. Like, <laughs> I, I wonder a little bit how 50K gets, gets far on 20 people, but interesting. <laughs> it's a Melbourne company here, so so I, it's very cheap to live in Melbourne compared to Sydney. 
So what the part that's confusing to me is core leadership team are like across the top on the right, and then there's sort of three possibly advisors. I don't know if no, they're all advisors. The first one's an advisor. It says research advisor. Yeah. And but I don't know if the other two. Yeah. So I don't and know if the, the other two are like, yeah. but are they in the team or are they? They're in there. My understanding is they're in the team. So okay. it is a so bit like confusing. One yeah. split out the advisor. I mean, yeah. as we've already discussed on these things, we hate seeing advisors and slides. We don't really care. But, you know, again, I, I don't necessarily hate. I mean, I just don't think they add very much is maybe a better way, better way to put it unless you're, you know, in very specific areas. Secondly, the team slide doesn't give me a lot about the team members. No, it doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't. It just gives them the role. Like it says Probably the, you know, like, yeah. you're giving that piece of, like, they're smart people, cool. I would hope, you know, all founders are smart people in some way. But, like, give me a bit of the achievement or, like, how you met each other even or, like, something like that. I don't disagree necessarily. I'd probably put a slightly different spin on it and to say that I really want to know, they've kind of tried to add a little bit about what their backgrounds are, Mm. but I think it needs to be a little bit better refined. And whenever I see 20 plus engineers in terms of size global, I go, you don't have to raise money unless you have raised money, in which case I'm thinking. Yeah. Are you talking like people you've paid on Fiverr.com? Yeah. Yeah. All I'd say for pre-seed founders, you don't need to make your team look huge. Yeah, just tell me who. A small team. We're not yeah, gonna have a lot tell, of money. Yeah, exactly. People tell like me who the core for co-founders work. are. Yeah, you know. And then we can, if you've got interns, great, but don't include them on the same side. <laughs> yeah, we're investing off the back of the core co-founding team. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And we want to know that you're going to be able to hire people, and so it's good to either have people there or people who you're going to hire or something. But like, yeah, agreed. All right, let's move on. Story. Last one. Story. This is a milestone. Story and, and ask. Line. Okay. Yeah. Milestones, okay, classic one. Founders saying they've achieved product market fit. <laughs> you know, I actually didn't see that. I mean, okay. what I first... The minute that you say to me you've achieved product market fit and you're like a seed stage company with less than like 100 million revenue, I'm like, you have not achieved product market fit, my friend. Anyway, you can achieve signs of product market fit, but everyone knows that signs of product market fit can even just be you spoke to someone in the street and they said, oh yeah, that sounds interesting. But anyway, so that, delete that one. I'm wondering a little bit on like, here it's talking about first paid customers, estimated ARR, and I'm like, where did this come from? Like, this is yeah. news. Like, who's been paying? What does that look like? What are they paying? You know, yeah. paid customers, there are multiple. Like, are they universities? Are they lecturers? Like, what are they? Like, yeah. you know, give me some more about that. Yeah. Present piece, raise 100K, uni Melb trial. I'm like, okay, cool. You're raising through the trial. That's not a bad thing to say. Uh, and I like their little thing on the side saying their 2024 milestones to achieve. Sure. You know, LMS integration, sure, that's complicated, annoying. Million ARR, okay, that's ambitious. I like that. 50,000 MAU, also ambitious, also like it. Five universities, also ambitious, also like it. Like, Yeah. I like the uh, milestones. It's good. Good milestones. I agree on the milestones achieved part. I'm not sure I would necessarily present it like this, but it's like fine. Presentation. Yeah, I, I just it's a bit confusing to me, but it's okay. It's okay. I get what they're trying to say. 50,000 so, MAUs and the one at mil ARR, I'm not sure that matches up with my thinking about where they will end up at pricing, but it doesn't matter. That's like, this something you I mean, that says before. the assumption is that in the first year, they're going to get five unis at 200K. And I yeah. go, okay, yeah. it's ambitious. Uh, do, do I agree with the pricing and it's going to work out that way? Probably not. But like, it shows to me that they're ambitious and they want to you know, really have a go at it. So I'm like, Correct. okay. Okay. What do you think of the ask 500k or the YC safe? Yeah, it's in the ask YC safe. You cho- you don't choose the documents. We choose the documents. Yeah, correct. You know, the terms of the documents are negotiated with your lead investors. So unless you have one, then you know you're just asking for 500k is what you're asking, and yeah. you're going to see what the terms are going to look like. That's right. No pie chart. I like a pie chart. I like little pie chart of like where the money's going. The personnel. It sort of has an indication of that by saying personnel cost 485k for engineers, and I go, okay, so you're going to say that of your raise, you're going to put like 95% into engineering and then there's going to be 5% for, which is 15K for OPEX, right? This yeah. is a trial cost, so I'll call that OPEX. Mm. And I go, oh, I'm not sure that pie chart makes sense in my head. So maybe I'm not understanding something there. Maybe they're going to fund other parts of the business from other things. I don't know. But I, it doesn't really give me a good idea of like use of funds breakdown as much as I would like. Yeah, I agree on that part. 
I think you probably need to explain that a bit more, but it, it ticks the boxes for me broadly in the how much you're raising, what are you going to spend it on? Well, as you said, that's a bit weak. I think I'd like to see a bit more on that. And then the third part of what you want to achieve, obviously, which is hopefully one MLAR, yeah. five universities. Got it. Cool. Cool. All right. Next slide. That's it. And I think okay. that's it. Cool. Feedback on this slide, scan to book in for a chat. And it just says to me, this is designed to be presented at a you know pitch night or something. Like, just give me the links, right? Give me the links. Give me an email address. Don't give me a weird QR code that I assume goes to a Calendly or something. Makes sense at a pitch night. Just doesn't make sense, you know, when you're sending a deck. But otherwise, yeah, pretty good. I don't mind it. Like, okay, what would you, what would the hue rating be? Six. Oof, that's pretty good. That's so bad. That's so bad. I six. think for me, I'd I'd give it six and a half. So I'd give it a bit higher than you. Yeah, like it's actually like it's a reasonable deck. Like I said, it's it's a bit probably too heavy in. Like it says to me that the founder is probably used to pitching at pitch nights, like and that, that particularly that last slide obviously says to me ah okay like pitch slide deck that different parts of it now make more sense and that, that that marketing language and things like that where you're not necessarily it's not purely for investing purposes that makes more sense with that context I guess or, or that sort of lens to look at it from, but but like like I said like had some very good elements to it I liked the ambition I, I thought it was a bit slow to kind of like. I said, had, didn't really showcase from way early on what they'd built so far because it sounds like they've built quite a lot. And I would have liked to have known that early and been like, oh, okay, cool. Like this is a company that has a product in market. Great. Yeah, I agree. I agree. They have built a lot by looks of things. Uh, it'd be great to show that a bit more, explain the features through uh, a few other parts, a bit too marketing, a bit more investor heavy, a bit less marketing heavy, but otherwise all good. Off the back of that, we did actually end up speaking with the founders. So we are in progress speaking with them. So anyone watching, you know, this is the type of deck that got you through the door. We're chatting with We can criticize as much as we want, but the reality is it still gets you in the door. Yep. You know, and we're still and the, chatting. And the key is for it to be interesting enough for us to have a follow-up conversation. So that's really the only thing you're looking for. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Galileo Ventures podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with a founder or investor that you think would benefit from what about we talked about today. Share, like, and subscribe. We are on Spotify, Apple, and YouTube. And give us a rating. That always helps. Until next month. Only if the rating's good, though. Only if the rating's good. That's right. Only give positive reviews. <laughs> if you like us, leave a review. If you hate us, email james at galilea.ventures. Thanks, you. <laughs> All right. Till next time. Bye-bye. See you later. <laughs>